Thank you so much, Ben. It's wonderful to be here in the presence of God during the Christmas season. This is my favorite time of the year. But before we start, I'd like to, I'd like to pray. So I'm going to get on my knees. And those of you who would like to pray with me, you're welcome to pray as well. Excuse me. Let me get myself situated here. <laughs> All right. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this Sabbath day. Thank you for another day of life that you've given to us, Heavenly Father. Thank you for the, the time that you've given to us to praise you throughout um, this Sabbath day. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you anoint my tongue, you anoint my mind, fill me with your Holy Spirit. So this message translates um, in the way that you want it translated, Heavenly Father. Prepare the harvest of people's hearts and, um, and prepare us to receive your Holy Spirit. You're coming soon, Jesus. You came once, you're coming again. We love you, we worship you, we praise you, and may this service be to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I keep this up or down? It doesn't matter? Okay. You don't hear my feet. Okay. So um, today, we're going to delve into the meaning of searching for God with all our hearts. And we're going to explore the often overlooked story of the wise men during Christmas. Beyond the familiar three wise men, there were likely more who visited baby Jesus because they traveled in a caravan and they created quite a stir when they were in Jerusalem. A caravan in those days was not only the wise men, but their servants, security detail, which means that more than likely there were several hundred people that were traveling with them. Throughout the Bible, there's no specification on how many there were, but these wise individuals meticulously studied the prophecies, and pursued the truth wholeheartedly. In contrast, many in Israel neglected these prophecies, leading to the unfortunate rejection of, rejection of their Savior, their Messiah, even before his birth. Jeremiah 29, 13 reminds us that seeking God with all our hearts ends in finding him. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Isn't that beautiful? What a promise. What a promise. In the story of the wise men, we find that they were philosophers from the East who, despite their wisdom, did not rely solely on their own opinions. Instead, they diligently sought for clear knowledge through the Hebrew scriptures, studying the prophecies and anticipating the Messiah's arrival. In Matthew 2, verses 1 through 12, the wise men's journey unfolds. They navigated challenges, they faced deception from Herod, and ultimately found Jesus and worshiped him with their gifts. Their obedience to the divine warnings ensured a different route home, avoiding Herod's destructive plans. Let's read it together. Please open up your Bible apps to Matthew 2, verses 1 through 13, or page 1,337 in the Bibles in front of you, in the pews. Page 1337 in the Bibles that are right in front of you, in the pews. And I'd like for us to use the Bible together. I'm not going to have everything on the slides. I'd like us to do it the old-fashioned way and just um, get that kinesthetic uh, 
experience of studying the scriptures, okay? Page 1,337. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 13. It says, After Jesus was born in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Verse 2 says, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The original Greek tells us that the Magi saw this star in the east, which means they came from ancient Babylon. It says, Legones puestin ho texes basileos ton ludayon, saying, Where is the one having been born king of the Jews? I think we're on a different slide. Okay. Slide, we're on slide three. Is that slide three? Okay, perfect. Eidomen gar autu ton astera en te anatole. We saw for of him the star in the east. In other words, we saw his star in the east. Slide four. Gael thomen prosigne sayauto and are come to worship him. Magi literally means magicians. That makes sense, doesn't it? In Desire of Ages, page 59.2, Ellen White says that they belonged to a large and influential class that included men of noble birth and comprised much of the wealth and learning in their nation. So these wise men were of the learned class in ancient Babylon that cultivated astrology and other kindred sciences. They were very familiar with astronomy. But this star, this star was different. In Desire of Ages, page 60.1, Ellen G. White says, The wise men had seen a mysterious light in the heavens upon that night when the glory of God flooded the hills of Bethlehem. As the light faded, a luminous star appeared and lingered in the sky. It was not a fixed star nor a planet, and the phenomenon excited the keenest interest. The star was a distant company of shining angels, but of this the wise men were ignorant. Yet, they were impressed that the star was of special import to them. They consulted priests and philosophers and searched the scrolls of the ancient records. The prophecy of Balaam had declared, There shall come a star of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Could this strange star have been sent as a harbinger of the promised one? The Magi had welcomed the light of heaven sent truth. Now it was shed upon them in brighter rays. Through dreams, they were instructed to go in search of the newborn prince. On to verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So Herod viewed Jesus as a threat to his throne. As far as Jerusalem, I want you to imagine something. Okay? Ellen White lays it out for us in the book Desire of Ages. Slide six. Okay. They have reached the land of Israel and are descending the Mount of Olives with Jerusalem in sight when, lo, the star that has guided them all the weary way rests above the temple and after a season finds uh, fades from their view with eager steps they press onward confidently expecting the messiah's birth to be the joyful burden of every tongue but their inquiries are in vain entering the holy city they repair to the temple to their amazement 
They find none who seem to have a knowledge of the newborn king. Their questions call forth no expressions of joy, but rather of surprise and fear, not unmingled with contempt. Let's move on to verse 4. When he had called together all the people, all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In literal Greek, it says that Herod called together all the chief priests and scribes. Kai sinagagon pantas tus archires grammates tu lau. And having gathered together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, epintaneto par auton pujo Christos genetai. He was inquiring of them where the Christ was to be born. Verse 5. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. So Herod is pretending to believe in Jesus, the Messiah, so that he can destroy him once he finds him. Okay? And verse 9. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed and worshipped him. They then opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. In Greek, it says that they were divinely warned. It's so beautiful to me how God used dreams to encourage and to warn them. And this is where the biblical account of the wise magi ends. They had traveled for about two years. So by this time, Jesus is about two years old. Because remember, verse 1 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east when it rose and have come to worship him. Verse 13 says, When they had gone, referring to, to the wise magi, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And in Greek, the literal translation says that he was seeking the child to destroy him. So, it's quite sad for me to think about this story because it ends horribly for the people of God, for the Jews. Since the Magi didn't return to tell Herod where Jesus was, he got very, very angry and had all the Jewish baby boys in Bethlehem that were two years old and younger killed. Matthew 2, verses 16 through 18 says, you can follow along with me in your Bibles. Then Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi. 
he was furious and he gave order to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Can you imagine? Regarding this event in Desire of Ages, Ellen G. White says on page 65.5, this calamity the Jews had brought upon themselves. If they had been walking in faithfulness and humility before God, he would in a signal manner have made the wrath of the king harmless to them. But they had separated themselves from God by their sins and had rejected the Holy Spirit, which was their only shield. They had not studied the scriptures with a desire to conform to the will of God. They had searched for prophecies which could be interpreted to exalt, to exalt themselves and to show how God despised all other nations. It was their proud boast that the Messiah was to come as a king, conquering his enemies and treading down the heathen in his wrath. Thus they, ex they had excited the hatred of their rulers. Through their misrepresentation of Christ's mission, Satan had purposed to compass the destruction of the Savior. But instead of this, it returned upon their own heads. On the other hand, the wise men had searched for God with all their hearts, and they found him. In Desire of Ages, page 59.3, Ellen White says, the light of God is ever shining amid the darkness of heathenism. As these magi studied the starry heavens and sought to fathom the mystery hidden in their bright paths, they beheld the glory of the Creator. Seeking clearer knowledge, they turned to the Hebrew Scriptures. In their own land were treasured prophetic writings that predicted the coming of a divine teacher. Balaam belonged to the magicians, though at one time a prophet of God. By the Holy Spirit, he had foretold the prosperity of Israel and the appearing of the Messiah. And his, his prophecies had been handed down by tradition from century to century. But in the, in the Old Testament, the Savior's advent was more clearly revealed. The Magi learned with joy that his coming was near and that the whole world was to be filled with a knowledge of the glory of the Lord. The tragic aftermath of Herod's rage and the rejection by the Jewish leaders serves as a poignant reminder, brothers and sisters. Ellen G. White in Desire of Ages emphasizes the Jews' role in bringing calamity upon themselves, illustrating the consequences of neglecting the study of scriptures with a humble heart. How often do we reject God's guidance because we fail to seek him with all our hearts? Our journey of faith should be characterized by humility and a desire to conform to God's will. As we reflect on the wise men's story, let's learn four essential lessons. Number one, the wise magi were determined to find the truth. They were determined. 
Number two, despite their wisdom, they did not rely on their own opinions regarding prophecies. Number three, they sought clearer knowledge through scripture. Four, upon finding Jesus, they obediently followed God's guidance. In my personal journey, a turning point came to me when I earnestly studied the prophecies. It led to a deep love inside of me for Jesus, and it really transformed my life. Today, I invite you, I invite all of you to commit or recommit yourselves to Jesus, acknowledging that the story of Jesus extends beyond his birth, embracing infinite depth of his eternal existence. He came the first time. He had entrusted his people with precious truths through the prophets and prophecies. He's coming a second time. He's coming again. As the messengers of truth, will we, will we reject him again too? Or will we search for him with all our heart so we can find him? Are we studying the prophecies that were entrusted to us to prepare for his second coming and share with the world? I invite you to start. If you would like to know more about Daniel and Revelation, I encourage you to search the prophecies with all your heart. Jesus wants you in heaven. We need to prepare. Read The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White. Yes. As Seventh-day Adventists, we are God's messengers of light. We are the modern-day stars of Bethlehem, guiding lights, called to spread the third angel's message to a lost, dark world that is desperate for hope. I have shared the prophecies in in a public school where people are just eating it up. They are dying to hear the truth. But how can we be guiding lights if we're not searching for God and his truth with all our hearts? Revelation 14, 9 through 12, is the heart of our message. And another angel A third followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Are we keeping the commandments? Seventh-day Adventists. We are called to give the third angel's message. We keep the Sabbath. We keep the commandments. That is the third, that is the third angel's message. There's some symbolism there. Do we understand it? We need to. God has blessed us as Seventh-day Adventists with a modern-day prophet, Ellen White. She's been used to open up the little book of Daniel as well as Revelation These are the prophecies that will prepare us for God's, for Christ's second coming. Daniel 12, 8 through 10 says in the English Standard Version, I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? 
He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Are we at the time of the end? Okay. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Who would like to recommit their life to Jesus today? Who is ready to be God's messenger and herald for Jesus' second coming? I invite you to come up. God and I would like to invite you to come up to commit or recommit yourselves to Jesus. I saw the hands. As you do this, I'd like to sing a song of meditation before I pray for you.
As my brothers and sisters have come up here to commit and recommit their lives to you, Jesus, pour your Holy Spirit on them. Pour your Holy Spirit on this church, Lord. The devil wants to take it. The devil wants to take this church, but you come in, Lord, and you transform their hearts, transform their minds, cleanse them, repel the devil from them, surround them with your angels to protect them as they go along their way, as they recommit themselves to Jesus, Lord. I pray that you bring people in their lives that will help them to grow, that will help them to be harbors of light, to be a lighthouse to this dark and lonely world that is desperate for you, Jesus. You came once, you are coming again. It is time to go out and share the third angel's message. Jesus is here. Jesus is in our hearts. Jesus is coming again. He came the first time. He's coming again. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, and protect us from all the distractions that the devil wants to bring into our lives, all the hurt, all the pain that he wants to cause so that we say, so that we reject you again, Lord. We, but we reject it. We stand here as your lighthouse to Laguna Niguel. We stand here, Heavenly Father, because we want to be filled with your Holy Spirit. We want to be like Job. No matter what happens, we do not want to give up on you, Jesus, because you, ha you are preparing mansions for us in heaven. You have eternal life ready for us. You are you have streets of gold. You have a beautiful nature that will never die. We will never wither away and die. We will not have to be hurting and sick. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us on the cross. We pray your Holy Spirit, the reigning of your Holy Spirit on this church. We pray for the latter rain. Come soon, Lord Jesus. I am tired of being here. I am exhausted. And I'm sure many here are, are as well. Come soon, Lord Jesus. And we pray for Cindy and Mr. Woods that you put your healing hand on them as well because they, ha they have a work to do as well. And they are... Just be with them, Heavenly Father. Put your healing hand on them and... and be with the doctors and nurses as they work with them. May they be transformed with your mind and your hands. In Jesus' name we pray, we ask, and we thank you. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep, keep you. May his face shine upon, shine upon you and give you peace. Merry Christmas. <laughs>